All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. From Lil Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. Warning: This video contains commentary touching on topics related to self-harm, substance abuse, mental health issues, and suicide. Viewer discretion is advised. Artists, writers, and musicians are well known to be tragic figures. Physical abuse, overdoses, psychological issues are all outcomes within the realm of possibility and, according to the media, likelihood surrounding the image of the artist. Today, we have an opinion piece, partly a stream of consciousness, but also structured and supported with references about what makes a work of art essentially good and of quality, not only to us, but to the artistic community. We're going to specifically explore why respected or highbrow art always seems to be tragic or dark in nature. Seems being the operative word here. Now, before we begin, I started off asking this question with no idea of why we had this association in the first place between quality art and basically themes related to suffering and tragedy. I didn't start out with a theory or a narrative. I constructed it naturally as I researched. I'll say my conclusion now because this is important to note before we get into the episode. I've come to believe that quality art does not necessarily have to be tied to dark themes, and the way media romanticizes the image of the tragic artist, painting suffering as a necessary precondition to quality works, is not only inaccurate and harmful to artists, but also encourages a type of one-dimensional art. That's not to say suffering, heartbreak, and melancholic experiences are not visceral feelings that can't be transformed to amazing art, just that it's not required for quality content. Of course, for this opinion piece, I welcome any and all replies. In fact, I'm hoping someone makes a video response. That way, I know I made it. And with that, I hope you enjoy this episode on media theory. Does art have to be tragic? Part one: The tragic artists. Vincent van Gogh, famous Dutch painter of Starry Night, among hundreds of other works, poverty-stricken and unstable for a good portion of his life, severed off part of his ear and spent a year at a psychiatric institution before ending his life a few months later. Sylvia Plath, American poet and novelist, clinically depressed for the majority of her adult life, was abused by her spouse, who was another poet beset by tragedy. Plath later ended up tragically taking her own life as well. Jimi Hendrix overdosed on sleeping tablets. Kurt Cobain of Nirvana shot himself. Amy Winehouse was found with fatal levels of blood alcohol content, pronounced dead by misadventure, which is a British term describing an accidental death resulting from voluntarily engaging in high-risk behavior. All three musicians here were found dead at the age of 27. We can also include other stars, Otis Redding and Mac Miller, as they similarly met their untimely demise at 26. There's even a shorthand name for this: the 27 Club. But if we take a microscope to the label, it turns out to be just a media narrative. In fact, statisticians Wolkowitz et al. published a paper on the topic in the BMJ, one of the world's oldest general medical journals. The paper, Is 27 Really a Dangerous Age for Famous Musicians? Retrospective Cohort Study, finds that no, out of the 1,046 top of the charts musicians, there's no statistically significant peak at 27, though there does seem to be an inextricable tie between musicians and tragedy. Famous musicians through their 20s and 30s had two times higher death rates than the general UK population. Not only the artists, but their creations, their life work, seem to frequently emphasize tragic elements. Respectable paintings that stand the test of time seem to usually depict suffering, some dark element, or at least a touch of melancholy. Take Goya's Saturn devouring his son, or Picasso's The Old Guitarist, for instance. Take a hefty portion of Salvador Dali's work with names like The Burning Giraffe and Autumnal Cannibalism. On top of that, most stories or dramas seem to only be considered literary if tragedy befalls the characters like Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath, anything by Franz Kafka, or going further back, Sophocles' Oedipus Rex. Actually, you can take just about any of Russia's literary giants, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Turgenev, Gurgel, whoever, and pick a random story. I bet you it'll be tragic. Songs we consider sophisticated also tend to emphasize the ways in which we're hurt, or even lamenting a different time. Take Adele's Hello, Neil Young's Old Man, or 2021's Grammy-winning record of the year, Billie Eilish's Everything I Wanted. Of course, to be fair, there are cases where particularly grotesque or tragic art goes the other way, in that you probably won't see the wider artistic community fawn over slasher movies, The Human Centipede, or content by someone like Marquis de Sade. Don't look this guy up. I don't actually want to give him a platform, but if you must know the bare minimum, he was a French nobleman that wrote lots of twisted stories. In fact, the word sadism was originally derived from his name. 
you've been warned. Anyways, there's a spectrum where the tragic is tasteful. Some fuzzy line between a Shakespeare and a Steinbeck, and perhaps Nabokov too, but he's cutting it close to the edge. The exact rules for where this tastefulness lies, I don't know. It could be interesting for a sociologist to study, really. Of course, different time periods have different takes on what's considered tasteful. Critics in Victorian era England, for example, would be appalled at most of the songs in Frank Ocean's Orange album, assuming they understood all the modern references. A certified banger of an album, by the way. While we in modern times are shocked at, say, historical incest among monarchs around the world, and works like Peter Paul Rubin's Lot and His Daughters depicting, essentially, the run-up to an incestuous act. I can't believe I have to say this, but I'm not endorsing incest by the way, just pointing a fact out. To get back to the matter at hand, there seems to be a correlation between what's considered respectable art and tragic content. On the flip side, bright optimism in our paintings like in Rockwell's Girl's Haircut or Kincaid's Hometown Lake are not to be taken too seriously, even considered kitschy. Stories like Dr. Seuss's How the Grinch Stole Christmas or any fantasy works outside of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, really, are not considered particularly literary. Hype anthems like ACDC's Back in Black or generally fun songs like Lil Nas X's Old Town Road lack sophistication. Of course, I love many of these artists as well, call me basic, but the establishment, the artistic community, whoever that may be in context, likely wouldn't consider any of these works particularly highbrow. Or does it only seem that way? Perhaps we're so obsessed with the trope of the tragic artist that we filter out anything that doesn't fit the mold. Perhaps as a society and due to the parasocial relationships we have with famous artists, we only notice and share stories about a few tragic artists we feel close to while most creators we know actually live fairly normal lives, at least within a standard deviation of everyone else when it comes to disaster in our lives. It could be that fame drives artists to tragic ends. After all, having so much wealth and attention is isolating in that you have to always play a part, you're subject to the public eye, and the vast majority of people simply can't relate to you. Or could it be that if a causation exists, it's the other way around. Perhaps already tragic individuals achieve fame because they have this need within them to bear their being to the world. Perhaps this outlet is what we call art, the dissatisfaction with our current reality that motivates the creation of an escape, or what could be. Or perhaps artists become famous as a result of the tragedy in their lives, as that could be a story that initially garners media attention. Admittedly, it's difficult to say for sure what the case is without some deep statistical research, which is why this is an opinion piece, but we do have some tools in our arsenal to excavate why this phenomenon occurs, if it's even accurate at all, that tragic dark elements in art strongly correlate to the work being respected by the artistic community. Let's now take a look at some historical theories on why we love our tragedies. Part 2. Catharsis through performance. A tragedy is an imitation of an action that is serious, and also as having magnitude, complete in itself. With incidents arousing pity and fear, wherewith to accomplish its catharsis of such emotions. From Aristotle's Poetics. Catharsis is a term with Greek roots, which means the purification or cleansing of one's emotions. Used by Aristotle in his Poetics, catharsis refers to the feeling of renewal in purging the fear, pity, sadness, and anger within you, being a spectator to dramatic pieces. Imagine holding on to all these anxieties and finally allowing yourself to experience the gamut of fear, pity, or sadness in a controlled, safe environment, almost as if you are on a therapist's couch, sinking into the comfortable cushions, a warm voice asking you to share what you think, guiding you. To a good portion of the ancient Greeks, tragedies have these therapeutic benefits, used for much more than just base entertainment. From this perspective, and further expanding this perspective out, every time you vibe with an emotionally charged song or work of art, every time you feel this sadness or fear in the pit of your belly to your mind, consuming the art, you are purging yourself of this emotion. At least, that's how this theory goes. Aristotle's Poetics is the earliest known surviving work of literary and dramatic theory, written in circa 335 BC, specifically analyzing tragedies. Strangely enough, though Aristotle uses catharsis to define tragedies, he makes no attempt to rigorously define the term catharsis itself. In his earlier works, references to catharsis refers to a purely medical term. According to classics professor Elizabeth Bielfior, it meant the evacuation of menstrual fluid. Of course, Aristotle's use of the word catharsis in his poetics only makes sense if the word was used metaphorically and poetically. 
As a result, there's scholarly contention on the precise definition of the word, but there's scholarly contention over anything worth talking about, I find. And even in things not worth talking about at all, it's alright, because if we wanted precise definitions of everything, this channel would be on engineering instead. After all, what is art if not interpretive by nature? Hmm, we may return back to that idea. We've taken a pretty Eurocentric view thus far, especially since many scholars of the dramatic arts outside of the Western world may not hold tragedies in such high regard, and even other thinkers around Aristotle like his mentor Plato would disagree that consuming poetry and tragedies would have generally positive outcomes. To simplify, and perhaps oversimplify, Plato as he aged believed poetic and dramatic works to be harmful to society as it instilled ignorance in the populace, much like how we view reality TV as being a brain-rotting guilty pleasure. He believed in the truth, and what is good is primarily achieved through practicing reason in our lives and through participating with the state, and the fanciful, artful words in poetry or dramas can place a spell on us to believe a warped view of the world to pursue unproductive ends, or worst of all, to even disagree with the state. To add to this, outside of the classical Greco-Roman Western tradition, over history we see a different type of art or performance celebrated in other contexts. Take Yoruba performance for instance. The Yoruba ethnic group in Western Africa has their traditional alarinjo, or traveling theater. Dressed in beautiful bright colors, this masked theater includes dancing and acting in vibrant costumes. The themes in the performances centers around retelling folklore, love, patience, moralities and the lack thereof, and fantasies, all in an entertaining, historically religious tradition of ghost mummery, according to The Origin and Form of the Yoruba Mask Theater by Joel A. Adedeji. On the more contemporary side, playwright Uber Ugunde, also commonly known as the father of Nigerian theater, had his breakout folk opera, The Garden of Eden and the Throne of God, as well as a number of famous plays and musicals delivering political commentary such as the famous Yoruba Ronu. Although these performances deal with serious political content, it tells the stories through music, dance, and satire in such a way that I wouldn't call them tragedies per se. They occupy their own space and musical genre as an art form. In China, there are traditional operas usually with some conflict and untimely deaths, but still frequently ending with happy resolutions, as with the famous The Peony Pavilion, where the main character is found to be virtuous from their imperial examination results and a benevolent emperor comes in, pardoning and rewarding all or the 14th century drama The Story of the Lute, where a corrupt official and a sweeping famine make up the tragic elements of the story, but it still ends in a harmonious resolution, after a moving show of filial piety. We may call this a tragic comedy, as defined by Professor Patrick Hogan in The Mind and Its Stories, where the middle sections of the works are tragic but the endings tend to be happy. We also see important non-tragic literary works, like with Journey to the West, one of the four great classical novels of Chinese literature, an endearing adventure story about a monk's pilgrimage, as well as Romance of the Three Kingdoms, set during the turbulent Three Kingdoms period in Chinese history. While many in the book die as a result of warfare and political scheming, the tragic moments aren't central to the work, and if anything serves as a chronological motive for vengeance, dominance, and more political machinations. Now that we've discovered a crack in our tragic perspective of highbrow art, let us take a look at the psychology of why we skew perceiving works of art as tragic. Part 3. The Psychology of Tragedy Genuine tragedy is a case not of right against wrong, but of right against right, two equally justified ethical principles embodied in people of unchangeable will. Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel Let us now employ some logical reasoning and, admittedly, armchair psychologizing. Back in part 1, we've highlighted works such as Goya's Saturn Devouring His Son, or Picasso's The Old Guitarist to drive home the point that important historical works tend to be dark, but what about Botticelli's Birth of Venus, or Klimt's The Kiss? Perhaps all of us, or it could be just me, have blinders on, a filter on what initially comes to mind when we think of great art, which perhaps speak more about my psychology than any bigger cultural trend. Let us also return back to the sentiment, what is art if not interpretive by nature, in part 2. Tragedy tends to dominate an interpretive power, meaning, as humans wired to survive and evolve to identify dangers, it seems that we tend to focus more on making sense and interpreting scenarios that can result in or represent a danger or the precursor to tragedy. Tragedies as a classifier, as a genre, tends to have this dominating power, implying a danger. Let's take this piece by Cy Twombly. When I first entered this room, currently an installation in London's Tate Modern, and saw the sheer volume of dripping red, what filled my mind 
was blood and gore. I saw danger, torture, and darkness. Then I leaned over and read the placard. It is from the Bacchus series, and it represents, well, the Roman god Bacchus of agriculture, wine, revelry, fertility, and drama. So these splashes of red represent splashes of wine and drunken dance, maybe some blood, but in goat sacrifices to the Roman god. Though, I still couldn't get this mixed association of dark revelry out of my head in this room of red swirls. A week later, I visited Jennifer Packer's exhibit at the Serpentine Gallery, a remarkable exhibit, and saw this work without context. At first, I thought, what a lovely bouquet of flowers. Then I turned my head to the placard once more. The work was named Say Her Name. It represented the decorative pieces shown at funerals, specifically the funerals of those who have died as a result of being racially profiled by police in the US, people like Sandra Bland. Jennifer Packer, the artist, wrote this on the work. Sandra Bland's death was profoundly disturbing. There was something that I couldn't say about why I was grieving for a stranger and why it was so painful. I noticed in my research that you could Google the funeral of someone who had been killed by police and see the funerary decorations. When I Googled Sandra, I couldn't find any images of her memorial. I felt unreconciled about that loss. What I'm trying to say is, you and the artist may have different interpretations of a piece of work. I subscribe to the belief where the creator's intention and the consumer's interpretation can both matter in how the work of art is to be defined. Namely, it requires only one of you to have a tragic or dark interpretation of the work for that association to stick. Not only that, but even if neither you nor the artist have tragic or dark interpretations of the actual work in question, there may still be a dark association based on the narrative around the artist themselves. Take any of Van Gogh's brilliantly bright post-impressionist works. Van Gogh could be trying to produce something beautiful. You could interpret this work as beautiful. But since Van Gogh lives such a disturbed life, you'll read that in some placard by the painting and you'll have this tragic association with the work nevertheless. Tragedy overpowers once again. Now, I'll illustrate this psychological phenomenon visually. Time to quickly employ our mathematical brains for this thought experiment. Let us take 100 works of art, and let us say, for the sake of example, a random distribution of 30% of individuals consuming the art would find dark or tragic themes within. Let us also say that we have, in addition, an independent and random 30% of the artists meaning for their work to have tragic elements. Of course, in real life, we'll have more of a correlation between artists and consumers labeling a work of art as tragic, but suspend your reason for this one little thing in the thought experiment. Then, let us finally say, on top of that, 15% of all these artists, once again distributed randomly, had led tragic lives. If we only need one of these three dimensions to be associated with tragedy for the work to be labeled tragic, then we see a skew towards the work becoming tragic like so. 1 minus the probability of not having a tragic association becomes 1 minus 0.7 times 0.7 times 0.85, which is 58.35% meaning if creators originally mean 30% of their works to be tragic, we can still have the majority of works, in this case 58% of them, associated with tragedy instead. And finally, here's my personal conclusion from all this. Respectable art does not have to be tragic, it just has to be interpretive. And when art is interpretive, we participate in coloring the work ourselves. We may project loneliness onto Robert Ryman white on white, or emphasize the tragic elements in Chinese operas, even when they have a happy ending. We tend to empathize with artists the most when they fall, when they have these somber stories surrounding their works, and we publish stories of their downfall to be constantly consumed, regurgitated, and redigested. Respectable works of art do not have to be tragic, nor are they overly skewed to have dark themes, but we often only remember the works with a dark narrative surrounding it, because it makes for a more fascinating story. The tragic artist, producing critically acclaimed works using brushstrokes dipped in suffering, is a trope. It is a romanticized idea, and insofar as it exists on this platonic pedestal, its shadows cast over cave walls. It will hold true. True unless we see beyond the tragedy. I simply love making content like this and frequently find myself asking these types of questions on why we perceive things in a certain way, why dark themes and creative pursuits seem to hold higher status, or how we reinterpret and co-opt the meaning behind works in each geography and each generation. I hope you enjoyed our episode today, and be sure to check out my other videos for a variety of critical content on literature, philosophy, and all sorts of mentally stimulating topics. Thank you, as always, for making it to the end.